So, um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I really appreciate your help in supporting local authors, and of which I'm one now. Um, I uh, wanted to introduce my husband back there, Michael. Uh, my name is Wendy Denny. Um, an easy way to remember that is I'm two restaurants strung together, so Wendy's and Denny. So. Uh, in my previous job when I was a sales rep, that was an easy mnemonic to give to people to remember who I was. I'm horrible with name, with trying to remember people's names, so uh, if anybody can give me a mnemonic to help me remember their name, I'm, I'm all about that. So anyway, I hope that helps. Um, so Mike and I uh, run the Guilford Bed and Breakfast. Um, you guys have been there, right? You guys look familiar. You've never been to no, the Guilford Bed and Breakfast? Okay. Well, it's, um, you know, it's been there since 1900, so you had plenty of time to visit. <laughs> Mike and I have been, um, we bought the place uh, almost five years ago now. This is actually our fifth year of running the place, so um, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. So if you ever get the time, please stop by and check it out. It's, it's historic. It's, um, it's lovely on the inside. Anyway, that's my plug for the Guilford Bed and Breakfast. <laughs> Um, so, how, how many of you are actually, do you guys write as well? You just read a lot, I imagine. And you guys, do you write at all? No. Not even on the side? No. Okay. Well, um, my other question that I have for you guys is, have you had the opportunity to read Gold Dust on the Highway? I know the library now has it, but have you had the opportunity? No, no, no. Okay, well, that's kind of good because I am going to be reading chapters one and chapters two from it um, tonight. Actually, I'm going to get right to it. Um, so uh, about me, I am an indie author. And are you guys familiar with indie authors? Are you familiar with that? Okay, good, because I, I hadn't heard that up until like three weeks ago and an author happened to introduce herself as an indie author. I was like, oh, great, that's fantastic. And then as soon as she was out of there, I'm Googling what the heck is an indie author. <laughs> and then I read it and I'm like, well, that's me. I didn't know there was a term for that. <laughs> so I'm learning something every day. It's, a, you know, the object of life is just to continue to learn as we, as we grow. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get stuck right into chapters one and two of Gold Dust on the Highway. Chapter one. Hey there, where are you headed? Chris shouted from the driver's seat through the open passenger window to the traveler along the side of the highway, his thumb pointing upwards. As she slowed to a stop, a breeze funneled through the vehicle, loosened a blonde section of hair, and whipped it against her face. Her nimble fingers swiftly captured the strays and securely tucked them behind her ear. The hitchhiker, he, hitchhiker stopped and turned, east as far as you can take me. His tall frame bent down to peek at the driver behind the wheel. East, I could have guessed that. After all, he was walking eastbound along the interstate. Was he purposefully being vague, she wondered? Do you smoke? She asked. What? No, he grinned. Wait, is this a trick question? Chris paused, scrutinizing the man's disheveled appearance. Two long-sleeved button-down shirts, neither buttoned, layered over a blue-gray printed tee. His relaxed jeans were worn in all the right places and fit him perfectly, but she noticed the latter before she actually stopped. Something about his friendly smile he flashed when he leaned into the window opening disarmed her. Her gut told her he was safe, and at 45 years old, she had learned to trust her intuition. Okay, hop in. Maybe you can help drive? Chris had left Roseburg, Oregon that morning and had already been on the road a little over three hours when she spotted the hitchhiker outside of Bend. By her calculation, she needed to conquer about 10 hours of driving per day to make it to her destination in time. Sure. He peeled his cumbersome backpack from his shoulders as Chris leaned over a cooler and across the seat to open the passenger door. I'm afraid you'll need to shift this cooler to the back first. Careful, it's rather heavy. There's plenty of room for your rucksack back there as well. The man opened the back door and placed his backpack on the floor behind the passenger seat, lifting the oversized canvas cooler from the front seat with what appeared to be very little effort. He positioned it between two suitcases and returned to the front. 
Chris was in the process of grabbing her jacket from the passenger seat when the man sat down. In trying to retrieve her hand quickly, she accidentally grazed the back of his upper thigh. She had hoped he didn't notice, but he eyeballed her, grinning. She blushed. Sorry, I was trying to clear the seat before you sat down. My jacket. She held it up and never finished her sentence. I didn't say anything, he shrugged. I just assumed it's my lucky day. Chris laughed, tossing her jacket over her shoulder between the front seats onto the back one. In the process, the snap from the sleeve cuff made contact with the man's cheek. He winced as it hit him. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. D did that hit you? Chris reached out her hand toward his cheek, but he jerked away. I'm so sorry, really. The man placed his hand over his tanned cheek, raised one eyebrow curiously, and studied her in silence. Look, if you'd rather get out and wait for the next car, I understand, she sighed. The stranger's mouth broadened into a wide grin. What, and miss all this delightful abuse? Chris bit her lip. I am sorry, I know, he finished her sentence. The man's knees extended all the way to the dashboard, so he adjusted his seat back as far as it would go and fastened his seat belt while Chris looked on. Clearly he wasn't leaving, so she put the car into gear, accelerated, and merged onto the highway. So, where are you headed exactly? he asked. Evidently same as you, east. Chris glanced over at him and caught him looking at her, but he diverted his attention to the highway ahead of them. Um, there are some bottles of water in that cooler if you're thirsty. Thank you. Shall I grab one for you too? Yes, please. The man unbuckled his seatbelt, twisted around, and with his long arm reached for the cooler on the center floor hump behind them. His shoulder brushed against hers in the process, and he pressed against her a little more with each passing second. Even with her long sleeve shirt on, warmth emanated from him, as did his breaths of effort. Shit, he blurted out, zipper stuck. What? Her mind momentarily wandered elsewhere, resisting the juvenile urge to giggle. Try to rearrange the contents inside a little so the zipper is not stretched and see if you can't back it up slightly before it goes forward, she advised, realizing that her instructions made it even funnier. But he obviously wasn't finding the humor in her words, so she ignored her last comment and tried to maintain a straight face, or as near to straight as she could muster. Okay, he grunted. I'm trying to rearrange the contents, but there's something hard pressing against it, and I can't seem to shift it with one hand. It's packed too full. The man straightened up in his seat and glanced over at her. Her shoulders were shaking at this point, and she was biting her lip to keep it from quivering. What are you laughing at? I'm not laughing, she lied, turned her face away from him while focusing on the road in front of her. Do you want to try to reconfigure the contents so I can unzip it? Chris started laughing, but immediately tried to cover it up with a pretend cough. She fidgeted with her rearview mirror to distract herself from his words. He reached around again and with one powerful tug, swung the heavy cooler around the seat and onto his lap, clipping her ear in the cooler, clipping her ear with the cooler strap in the process. Ouch, she grabbed her ear. You almost took my ear off. I'm sorry, are you okay? Chris cupped her hand over her ear. Let me see. He placed his fingers around the slen her slender wrist to pull her hand away. She resisted initially, but then allowed him to look. Well, it's a little red, but I don't see any blood. I am pretty sure you'll survive. You almost took my, my cheek off and I nearly sliced off your ear. Maybe we should call a truce before something really important gets cut off. They both laughed. Touche, she added. Once the cooler was on his lap, it didn't take long for the passenger to conquer the zipper dilemma and extract two cool bottles of water, one for each of them. Without asking, he unscrewed a cap and handed the bottle to her before opening his own. And for your reference, I normally don't unzip before I've been formally, or at least informally, introduced. He reached his hand out to her. I'm Joe. Chris couldn't help but smile. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. Joe, I'm Chris. She accepted his hand and shook it. Nice to meet you, they spoke in unison. Chris switched on the radio to a station playing mellow classical music. Immediately, the sound began to fade in and out. Joe pulled a ball cap out of the, his back pocket of his jeans, placed it on his head, and angled the visor down over his face. He then reclined his seat and closed his eyes. Chris watched him out of the corner of her eye and turned her attention back to driving. 
She had four days to concoct something suitable for the eulogy she had been asked to give. Four days. What would she say? What was there to say? Chapter 2. Joe had been sleeping soundly for the better part of three hours when the car's fuel gauge pointed to empty. It was just as well because Chris's bladder was nearly full. The last roadside saint... The last road sign revealed that they were near Ontario, Idaho, a small town of 10,000 people. It was a few minutes past six o'clock, and since they weren't exactly driving through a metropolis, she thought it best to stop. She had run the car's gas gauge far into the negative zone before, but she wasn't sure how many miles would pass before she spotted the next gas station and was too tired to accept that risk. Joe didn't stir until the car came to a complete stop at the fuel station. Break time? He suddenly awakened. He swung his legs out of the car and closed the door behind him. He returned to the car, reopened the door, and added, Sorry, did you want anything? Nah, I'll be in shortly, but thanks. He nodded. Now don't leave without me. I won't. I need you to help drive, remember? When Joe returned to the car, Chris was nowhere in sight, and the car was locked. He leaned up against the side and his cheeks reddened in response to the evening's cool air. Suddenly hungry, he opened the bag of peanut M&Ms, grabbed a handful, and dropped them one by one into his mouth. A few moments later, Chris emerged from the convenience store wearing a smile that stretched across her face. Joe watched her approach. Hey, what's with you? Three M&Ms bounced off the side of his lip and onto the cement platform near his feet. He ignored them. I'm starving. You hungry? Or have you completely ruined your appetite with those? Chris motioned toward the bag in his hand. As he quickly twisted the bag closed and hid it behind his back, like a child caught misbehaving. A little late to hide it now, don't you think? You are totally busted. Chris scooted back in behind the wheel while Joe resumed his place in the passenger seat. Damn, I guess that means I have to share now. Joe reopened the bag and leaned over and held it out for her to access the peanutty chocolate morsels. Thank you, don't mind if I do. Chris took a handful and started dropping the pieces into her mouth as he had done earlier. Supposed to be a roadside diner about 10 minutes away. After swallowing all the candy in her mouth, she started laughing again. What's funny about that? Evidently, it's called Granny Patties. She laughed again. I thought that man back there in the store was saying Granny Panties. I kept thinking that can't be the name of it, so I had him repeat it three times before I got it. Joe burst out laughing. Yeah, I'm not sure Granny Panties is likely to evoke the strongest of appetites. Exactly. But the man assured me that it was the very best eatery around, and I'm starving. You want to try it? Sure. I'm game. I can always eat. Chris followed the attendant's directions, and soon enough, they saw the 1950s-style diner with the big sign, Granny Patties for Home Cooking Goodness. The gravel parking lot consisted of several parked vehicles forming a neat row alongside the building. They got out of the car and entered the restaurant. Welcome to Granny's. Table for two? The cheerful, middle-aged hostess, sporting a beehive hairdo and thick makeup, flashed her rather prominent teeth at them. Chris and Joe exchanged glances and shrugged their shoulders. That's right. Probably be about a 15-minute wait for a table or, hold on, there are two seats at the bar. Which do you prefer? The bar, please, Chris replied, glancing around at the heaping mounds of food on the plates in front of the other customers. Joe and Chris snatched the empty seats and scanned the small menu, which appeared to be a neatly handwritten copy of a copy of a Xerox. Special tonight is Salisbury steak smothered in mushroom gravy and served with green beans and garlic mashed potatoes. Soup du jour is homemade vegetable. Can I get you something to drink while I give you a minute to decide? The husky girl behind the bar, sporting the thick ponytail and bright pink lipstick, Looked to be around 17, yet she had the brassy voice of an old barfly. I'll have that special, honey, Joe spoke up, and a large Pepsi if you have it. Oh, Chris floundered around for a second, glancing over the menu. And I'll have the giant grilled cheese with the bacon, tomato, and spinach with a side of cinnamon applesauce, please. The interior of Granny Patty's was squeaky clean down to the original wood planks on the floor. 
The food smelled divine. On the walls, decorative cross-stitching artwork hung, complete with handwritten price tags dangling from each piece that caught the eye when the hustle-bustle of the staff whooshed by. From her bar seat, Chris strained to catch a glimpse of the infamous granny through the small pass-through behind the bar, but only spotted a skinny, tattooed cook shouting the occasional order up to no one in particular. Chris and Joe eagerly occupied themselves by checking their cell phone messages while waiting for their dinner to arrive. They didn't have long to wait, as it turned out. That man in the gas station wasn't lying when he said it was well worth a stop. As they got up to leave, however, they passed an elderly couple coming in. The higgledy-piggledy path between the tables made it a bit of a tight squeeze as those entering were rather rotund around the middle and the space near the doorway was quite narrow. Susanna? George? Is that really you? The soft-spoken woman in a flowery dress and a cardigan sweater placed her frail hand on Chris's forearm. Why, I haven't seen you in... Chris shook her head in protest. No, sorry, I'm not... Must be about 30 years now, Ethel. The older gentleman added as he looked back and forth between Chris and Joe. Come here, you two, give us a hug. With arms outstretched, he corralled both Chris and Joe into his embrace before either could resist. It was clear he wasn't taking no for an answer. Once released from the embrace, Joe glanced over at Chris as if they were both caught up in the twilight zone. But before they spoke, Ethel's eyes welled up with tears. We always knew you would come home one day. And with that, she embraced Chris and placed a kiss on her cheek. Tell me, how are the children? How's your mother? Oh, you really must come home with us and tell us all about it. I'm so sorry, but you both are mistaken, Joe tried to explain. This is not Chris. Or this is Chris, not Susanna, and I'm Joe, not this George person. Ethel placed her hand over her mouth and gasped. Suddenly, as if a light came on in her head, she smiled. Then, just as quickly, a fog appeared to glaze over Ethel's eyes. She placed her index finger over her lips. I'm so sorry, I must have been mistaken. Please do forgive me. It's nothing, an easy mistake, Chris replied, softness in her tone. She turned to leave. Well, that was a little weird, Joe whispered once out of earshot from the restaurant. No kidding. Hey, would you mind driving a little? Chris fished for her keys in her purse. When she looked up, Joe was staring back at the restaurant. She turned around to see the elderly man approaching. Oh, I'm sorry about that back there. My name is Frank, and Ethel is my sister. She suffers from Alzheimer's and sometimes lives in her own world. Susanna was her daughter, and George was Susanna's husband. Both were killed in a car accident about 30 years ago. You see, they were about your age when it happened. Ethel meant no harm. She simply visits a different reality at times, and I do the best I can to take care of her. Oh, I understand. I'm so sorry, Chris replied. Yeah, I had an aunt like that, so I understand. It can't be easy for you, Joe empathized, opening the car door. Chris opened hers. Wait a minute, please. Frank rubbed his forehead. I'm sure you both have somewhere to go, but I was wondering. Frank paused to take in a deep breath and swallow. Listen, it would mean the world to her if you would consider sparing a few moments. Come back to our place and play the part for a little while, he pleaded. I realize this must sound awfully weird, and I will understand if you say no, but it would mean the world to Ethel, and she has so little joy in her life anymore. You want us to come to your home? Chris paused, trying to make sure she understood his request, and to pretend to be George and Susanna? Frank looked down at the gravel, somewhat embarrassed over his request, before meeting her eyes once more. It's only for a little while. Perhaps stay for dessert. Oh, it would make her so happy. Three strangers stood in the parking lot, connected by an awkward silence. Well, Chris glanced at Joe before looking back at the older man. I don't really know what to say. Can you give us a minute? Certainly, he nodded, lowered his eyes, turned and walked a short distance away. Chris looked over at Joe to try to read his expression. Although she was his ride, his opinion mattered because the decision involved both of them. I'm not in any big hurry. Consider this. What if we were in his shoes? I don't mind playing a part if that's what you want to do. It's pretty weird, but in the kindest, gentlest way. That poor man. That poor woman. 
she sighed. I'm stuffed, but a free coffee for the road sounds pretty good. What do you say, George? Let's do it, says Anna. And that ends the end of um, chapter, chapter two. Uh, I hope that wet your whistle uh, just a little bit. Did you enjoy that? Hi, Lou. <laughs> so um, I forgot to mention, um, we did bring coffee. If you wanted to take a little break and help yourself to the coffee here, um, feel free to help yourself. And I'm just going to continue going on. So anybody want coffee? Everybody's all good. Okay. So a little bit about... Um, my process for writing. Um, so uh, most professional writers, um, I would imagine, uh, generally have a plan, they have an outline, they might have a very detailed outline, they might have a map, they might have a diagram that has different points that they want to go through in the story that they're going to be writing. I'm not like that, at least I'm not like that yet. Um, when I write I am actually considered, and this is a new term for me, and maybe you guys all know it, and I'm the only one living in a hole, and I've never heard this before. Have you heard the word pantsers referring to a writer? P-A-N-S-E-R-S. Okay, good. So I'm not the only person who had never heard of this term before. <laughs> so I didn't know what it was, and I happened to come across it um, online. And I read the definition, and I read the word again. I'm like, I have never heard this before. But the definition fit me completely. It basically means writers that fly by the seat of their pants. So they don't have a plan when they start. They start the story, they just jump in, and they go with it. That's, that's kind of like how I do it. My process is much more free and unencumbered by roles and boundaries, and I don't need to know everything that's going to happen in order to generate the story. I usually start with my characters, um, and somehow I jump into their minds, and they take me where they want to go. So I know it sounds kind of really weird, um, but I think that my characters are more creative than I am. And they live their life, they encounter things along the way that I don't plan ahead to happen. and they say things that comes that's not something I would say and I just go with it I'm there for the ride I'm in the zone this is what's happening I'm just documenting it and it's a really cool freeing feeling for me to be able to write something like that I will say that I started writing about 20 years ago and the probably as I grow as a writer I'm leaning more towards and and I and I don't do this on purpose but I tend to now I'm coming up with plots where before I, I, I knew what characters I wanted to put in the story and then I would go from there and now I'm just starting to like a plot will surface in my head I wasn't thinking about anything I was tr not trying to come up with anything and a plot will surface and I'll be like wow that's a that's a really good one. I can't wait to start on that story because now I know where, for a change, I know where it's going to go, or at least the main part of the story where I can lead the story to that point. And that's kind of cool. Maybe that means I'm growing as a writer. <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> so um, I started writing about 20 years ago, uh, Mike and I, when we lived in Florida. Um, and I started with my autobiography. Um, have, and I know that you have, um, Lou, has written, how much of your uh, chronicles have you completed to date? Because he, he is writing, he's from the Piscataquist Writers um, Alliance. Alliance? Yeah. And how much have you completed to date? Well, in terms of completed, probably only about four or five chapters. But in the review process, we're up to about 24. Wow. So he's moving right along. He has a very interesting um, take on writing his, um, his chronicles, really. Um, I found it, I started, God bless you, by the way, um, I started by writing my autobiography, and I, I kind of sectioned it off with the, the first group was uh, from my earliest memories up until I completed high school and then my college days, and then, you know, that's how old I was, so I, I kind of stopped there, so I didn't know what else was going to happen in my life, so I wrote up to there. But 
you know, it's funny, I found it very therapeutic just to get things down, even if you're not writing for another person to read, just getting down what you experienced as a child, no matter if you had like an incredible childhood or you had a troubled childhood, getting that down on paper I found was just very therapeutic. But it wasn't just that, it really kind of sparked my interest in writing and writing stories and telling stories. So that was kind of where I started. When Mike and I decided to move out to Oregon, um, I was very, very lucky to be able to um, join a writer's group out there. And uh, we were out there for about 12 years. And um, so those 12 years, I was involved in this incredible, incredible writer's group out there, all of which, um, there was about seven people in that writer's group, all of which are now published authors. and. Um, a couple of the ladies that were in the group, they were in their 80s in this group, and they hadn't published anything yet when I started, but luckily two of the ladies got published. Um, oh, they must have been like 83. I mean, they were getting up there, and thank God they didn't wait any longer because um, they passed away soon, soon after these got published. And we had the one lady who actually started the group out there, very, very unfortunate, and she was also in her 80s, and she had written this trilogy that took place in Victorian times. It was absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. And she never got it published, and I'm sure that that manuscript probably went up in flames and nobody will ever, ever see the light of day. So if you have a story in you, don't wait on that because we never know how much time we have to get that story out. And it's such a shame that the world won't get to read those that trilogy that she wrote and her family didn't want to have anything to do with it, so we, we never know what, what happened to it. Um, so that's, um, that's very unfortunate, but I, I will tell you, when I was in that group, you know, I started, if there is a scale of superb writers and then just starting out writers that know absolutely nothing, I started out way down here, and that really moved me much further up the scale and I think if I didn't have that writers group at that time you know I'd probably still be way back here you know I maybe moved an inch but um, that just helped me so much in getting the ball rolling and helping me decide that I wanted to do this um, one of the things that appeals well not one of the things there's several things that appeals to me about fiction and um, Maybe you can kind of explain what you like about fiction as well before I talk about what, what appeals to me about writing it. Does anybody have anything that they can, what is it about fiction that appeals to you? I think there's like not as many constraints to it, so it can be whatever you want. I feel like a lot of times when I'm reading nonfiction or even historical fiction sometimes, depending on how close they're trying to get to what actually happened. Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know if that actually happened, or I don't know how. And so if you're reading fiction, it can be, you can just kind of throw all that out. The yeah, window. it is kind of limited with that. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I love about it. Um, for me, fiction is entertaining to write. Um, it is an escape for me because I jump into my story and poor Mike, if I happen to be writing and I'm involved in my story and he comes in, the house could literally be on fire. I'd have no idea because I'm living in this story. I'm in the zone and I'm right there. And I've even had um, experiences. I, I'm not always in that perfect zone, but you can tell by the writing that comes out of it when I am in the zone, it's smoother. It's, it's much better written than when I'm forcing it to come out. And um, I remember in the first novel that I wrote, Hope and Unity, I have a scene in there where um, there's a mother to the main character and she's, she's an alcoholic and she's very, very abusive to her daughter. And I, I've never exper personally experienced anything like this, but I, I had a friend who had just died um, like two months after we moved to Oregon. She was my best friend and she uh, basically killed herself on alcohol. She, she she just drank too much. I didn't even know it was that. I knew she drank, but I didn't realize it was a problem and clearly it was a problem. She ended up drinking herself to death. 
And anyway, I knew her mother and I knew she also drink, drank. But anyway, I kind of took the pain from that. And when I was writing about in the story, how she was treated and, and what her, the kinds of things that her mother was saying to her. I mean, she's completely drunk at the time, but um, it was just horrific things. I don't know where that came from because, like I said, it never happened to me. I was putting this down in there. I'm writing and I am bawling my eyes out about this fictitious character because I'm feeling the pain that I'm writing. And it's like, I don't, where did that come from? I have no idea. Like it was just, but it was so real and I experienced it. I do the same thing sometimes, which is much more pleasant when I, when I write in a scene that has to do with people finding characters, finding themselves in a very embarrassing situation. And um, I, I've experienced enough embarrassing situations to know that at the time, it's never really that enjoyable. But 10 years later, when somebody refers to it, you know, all the stress is gone from it. And it's just really funny. And when you write a scene, there's no lapse of time. You can just laugh right away because your fictitious character is going through this thing and you know it's not you, it's them. So they have to deal with it and they have to find a solution out of there. So it's, um, it's very fun. And ultimately why I like fiction is, although, and my husband will attest to this, um, I'm not a controlling person, right? Okay, so I'm a little bit controlling. But um, so what I like about it is you get to control everything. It's your world that you're controlling. It's your characters that you're controlling. You control what they encounter, how they respond to what they encounter, and everything about it. It's like a control freak's dream to be able to write something and nobody's there to say, oh, you can't have that character do that. She wouldn't wear the color blue. Oh, yeah, she would, you know, and you get to basically play God in this scenario. And it's fun and it's freeing. And I tell myself about my controlling side, if I control everything in my stories, then I can chill out and be less controlling in real life. I don't know if that's true. Mike's shaking his head no. But I like to think that way. <laughs> so maybe in some alternate universe that actually works. <laughs> but until then, um, that's, that's, I'm going to go with that. You know, I'm just going to go with that. Um, so there is a couple things um, that I wanted to mention um, aside from the writers group um, and we had a writers we have a writers group here as well um, different writers um, I think one of the biggest difference between our writers group in Oregon and the writers group here is everybody there was writing fiction and so it was a more specific writers group where in our in the current one, you know, we have poetry because there's not enough people to pull from to get everybody, you know, who's writing fiction. So it was pretty much a writer's group and they could write anything. And uh, it was a little bit um, more difficult for me because I, I know absolutely nothing about poetry. I don't even have the skills to really appreciate it as I should. I don't understand it and I can't critique it because it's, it's so, I, I found it difficult. So I, I feel that um, I was much more comfortable with all fiction writers because then I know what to look like. I, I know what to look for. I can help others improve um, in, in my critique and with feedback and they're more specific with their feedback for me. So um, if you're at all interested in writing at all, I highly recommend that you connect, to, you, that you get connected with a, a writer's group. Second thing that I used a lot was um, beta readers. So are you familiar with beta readers? Okay, so beta readers, uh, they don't have to be where you are living. They can be anywhere. It's a group of people that you know. And the best beta readers in the world are people who you're not related to, you're not friends with, but they read a heck of a lot. That's what you're looking for. And then if you can assemble people like that um, together, and then what you do when you're you finished your book and you've edited it the best that you can, you send your book out and they will read it and they will reply with comments. And they're not a professional editor, but they know a lot because the more you read, the better writer that you will ever become. So um, that was a big help to me as well because I would get all their feedback and all of their changes and everything as well to incorporate in my edits. So in the future, um, 
I, I do have a website, a author website, and it's WKD, which are my initials, dash author.com. So if you're interested in knowing um, what stories are coming down the pike, if you want to be aware of when the next one is published, um, that website is the place to go for that information. Um, I have a feedback form that I'm going to be passing out to everybody. If, um, if you could take a few minutes and fill it out um, before you leave, it just helps me get to know you a little bit better, get to know my audience and any kind of feedback that I can get back from the people who I'm speaking with is, is helpful to me. So if you could do that, I wanna thank you in advance for doing that. I have them up here and when I'm done, I'll go ahead and pass them around. Um, but what is coming down the pike? Oh, by the way, the my website is not a website that you can purchase anything from. It's not any business. It's specifically there for information. So you can read about um, the books that I have available now and then the ones that will be coming down the pike. But there are links there if you do want to buy anything that will link you to Amazon where you can buy everything you want on Amazon. So a couple things that are going to be coming down the pike. I am somewhere in the middle of my story that's called Summer of Secrets now that I'm, I'm hoping to complete by the end of the year. And that would be great if I could get it published by the end of the year. It's, um, this story takes place in the early 70s. And the two main characters are two young little girls. Well, little, they're, they're 10 years old and 13 years old and they're sisters. And they're very, very poor and they live in Southern Alabama just inside like a little forested area. So they're, they're very kind of isolated. And the story starts off with a bang, literally, and then it goes from there. So I'm kind of following the lives of these two little girls of how they're gonna survive, um, what's been happening to them. So I am, I don't know, I'm guessing maybe halfway through that. So I'm hoping to get that out before the end of the year. Um, Hope and Unity is the first novel that I ever wrote that's gonna need some serious editing before I can, um, before I can go to press with something like that. But it's a good story, but it's one of those that I had no idea where it was gonna end up. I had no idea where I was going. I just jumped in with the characters and I was there for the ride and I just documented it. Um, and the next thing that I plan to publish is an anthology, which is just, just gonna be a collection of all the shorter stories that I wrote combined into one book. And that's going to require a lot of editing too but i'm hoping to get all three out by the end of the year we'll see how that goes um so i wanted to tell you tonight if you wanted to buy all three books you basically pay for two of the books and you get the third one free i have a special going on for that um if you're interested and um i wanted to allow some time if anybody had any questions about anything i'm happy to answer What do you what do you like about self publishing versus being like a publisher? Okay, so for me, um, I am a graphic designer by trade, mm -hmm. um, so I have the experience of all the layout and everything. So that is really pretty easy for me. I use KDP Publishing because it's seamless and it's really very easy, even for somebody who's not a graphic designer. And when you try to go through a traditional publishing company because I started out s submitting things to a traditional publisher and the time and the effort and the energy that it takes to submit I don't have the patience for it um, a friend of mine um, I, she was very diligent with this and and sometimes when people get published it has less to do with the quality of the writing and more to do with that writer's tenacity to keep at it until it gets done, you know? And um, I think with publishing, when you try to publish the traditional way, oh my God, if you've never done this, you have no idea the, the amount of energy that's required for this. So first you have to find a publisher who's accepting the type of stuff that you write some of them have stipulations where we only accept publishers from this state or this country and you can't have published anything before and they have like 50 50 spec you know specifics that you have to follow just to send to them and then you do that and when you sub make a submission a lot of publishers have these um these rules where 
you are not allowed to submit that same piece to any other publisher until they get back with you with whether they want it or not. <clears throat> Some publishers take six to eight months to get back to you. So they say, let me give you some statistics because that's an excellent question. I wrote these down. The chances of an author getting their first work published is one to 2%. That's really, really low. And this is fiction, this is not nonfiction. On average, a writer will compose 3.24 books before publishing a piece. And a New York City literary agency represents about one manuscript in 4,000. That's very small percentage. And a lot of times, first time writers aren't even eligible to even start thinking about having a literary agent until you're well established. So some publishers, another stipulation is you have to have an agent, you have to, ha you have to be an agented writer, or some of them say, no, you can't. So just researching what possible publishers might at some point in your life be interested in a, the type of story that you've written, you could research that for months and narrow it down and find 20 publishers. Of those, some you will have missed their, um, their little window of submissions. So you have to look at the dates as to when you might have to wait till the next mm -hmm. year. And by the time the next year runs around, it it's a bloody nightmare. <laughs> and I am I have like no patience to begin with. And when I thought, okay, I could submit this to 45 different publishers, it'll take me 30 years to do that. And then I might still get rejected at the end. Or I can spend those 30 years writing more because I enjoy that. <laughs> and uh, so I, I chose the focusing my attention on what I enjoy doing. Life's too short. Um, so yeah, publishers, they can be a nightmare. I think it's amazing for anybody who they submit anything. It's a little bit different if um, the publisher, it's a very small publishing house and they're looking for very, very specific type of writing and you happen to be that specific writer for that, then, then it all fits together and they're able to you know, publish something. The other good thing about going through KDP is it's um, direct press, which means um, there's no contracts to deal with, like when you deal with um, a, a traditional publisher and they send you a contract and they take so much of your rights and royalties. When you're self-published, you retain the rights and royalties of your manuscript completely. And when you use um, someone like KDP Amazon, um, you don't have to buy a chunk of books and then uh, you know shell out all that money 500 a thousand depending on how many you're getting and how many you're starting with you don't have to guess how many people are actually gonna buy it and then put all that money into somewhere KDP is direct to press um, they're print on demand so when one person wants the book they'll print out one book and they'll send it and that's how the press is they They've really been like that for probably the last 15 years or so. And it makes it a very effective way to do it because then the writer doesn't have to shell out all this money up front in order to get the ball rolling. Now, I, I can purchase my own book from Amazon and I do at a discounted price because, you know, they're not, I don't, I don't make any money on it, you know, as far as like the royalties and the sales and stuff. So, but they give me, give me the, the book at cost. So if I turn around and sell it to somebody who's not on Amazon, you know, I make a little bit of a profit, you know. But um, to me, it's like a no-brainer. If, if I ever get to the point where I'm a best-selling author, then yeah, definitely I'll want an agent. And then they deal with all the crap. They, they do the negotiations with the legal contracts and all that. You know, I just, I don't want to deal with all of that that typically comes with traditional publishing. If I can avoid it, spend my time elsewhere with doing something that I actually enjoy, then it just makes sense for me. Um, but that's an excellent question. I'm glad I got to throw those quotes in there because those quotes are really astounding. I mean, how rare it is for somebody to actually, and then what astounds me, <laughs> now I'm going on a rant, but sometimes you'll pick up a book that is really published from like a really good publishing house. 
and like you find errors in it. I mean, and I know nobody's perfect and my books aren't perfect either. But when somebody goes through all that bother and you know they've gone through probably three or four different specific professional editors associated with that publishing house and the book comes out and you're like, the heck is this? What were they thinking? What were they smoking on the day that they chose this over the 4,000 other books that were actually good? Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's my little rant. It's amazing. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to put in here. J.K. Rowling, you probably know this already because a lot of people do. Um, she actually pitched for Harry Potter and was rejected 12 times before that was accepted. So, I mean, it's writer's a lot of times they say you have to have tough skin um and but the few times that i did submit my stuff to um to traditional publishers when i was rejected it was actually quite a nice letter so maybe i just got lucky um and a lot of times they would you know they would say i mean usually they don't write back and say your writing is total crap you should give up your writing career and you know start cleaning toilets or something you know it's usually it's not like that you know they'll say it's not exactly what we're looking for it's not the niche that we are wanting to you know market to right now but even with publishers you can submit something to a publisher like as often as you want because the people who are reading what's coming in could change from one day to the next. You could get someone, you, the first person who reads it might absolutely hate it and, and prefer everything over yours. The next person that gets it when you submit it again, even if it's to the same company, you might get someone else who's re reviewing it and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread. And then you, you've got your deal. So um, it, it's really hit or miss and it's, it's really difficult to try and stay on top of the organization of everything because when you're submitting to multiple publications one publication is going to say okay i want you to write a 20 word synopsis or a 20 page synopsis of your story so then you've got to spend time writing that just to submit this to the publisher another publisher is going to say no i want a 600 word of just a center part of the plot of your pro you know so you are essentially rewriting large bits of your work i mean it's rare now that somebody just says send me the whole thing oh no they don't have time to read the whole thing they want selected bits or they want you to write a compilation of you know certain things that are happening and, and it's like <laughs> that's like way too much work <laughs> so um yeah it's just crazy doing something like that does anyone else have any questions character names do you just pull names out of a hat or do certain names seem to fit a person that you're writing about how do you decide i um <clears throat> i have on occasion started with a specific character name and as i got the as the story got going i i decided to change them um, different people have different feelings of the type of character that is associated with a name and i think a lot of that goes back to when you well for me it goes back to when i was in high school I knew a girl named Lisa, and those characteristics that she had in high school, anybody who's named Lisa in a book, that's the image that comes up. And it's different for everybody, but it seems like there are some, I don't know, if you took a poll of like 500 people and you said the name, what is you guys' name? Carl. And Stacy. And Stacy. Okay, good. Um, like if you say the name, Peggy in your story like what what kind of image is evoked in your mind when you say Peggy any any thoughts no thoughts at all wholesome <laughs> wholesome see I like for me I immediately because of my associations of the Peggy's that I've known I automatically think chunky chunky and for some reason i know that piggy or you know piggy is one letter off of peggy and i just go it my mind immediately goes to so if i am if i am building a character or i'm naming a character in my story and she happens to be really really tall really really slender and absolutely drop dead gorgeous i am not naming her peggy 
you know. So it's really a personal thing with what the author does. But I, I would, I think, but I don't know this for sure, that like if you got 100 people together and you had a picture of a person and maybe five names they could choose from as to what that person's name might be, I would think that maybe 40% of them might pick the, the same name. Um, and I don't, I don't know why that would be. But um, I think it really comes down to you pick what you feel would most match that one character. And I think it's, it's less about right and wrong. And, and it doesn't matter what name you start with because that can always be changed down the road. Um, is my time up? Did I go over the limit? No, nope. no, you're still good. Um, one other thing I wanted to um, touch, you know, I mentioned that I was a graphic designer, so putting the book together on KDP just made sense for me because it takes me a lot less time to do something like that. One thing that Adobe, is anybody familiar with Adobe software? Okay, so the creative suite has like Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator and all of those good things. Well, I know those programs. I've, I've used those programs a lot. One of the best things about the Adobe program is it has these two two keys that when used in succession, um, it does like, it's a control Z. And it is like God's gift to mankind. And what that is, is an undo. And one of the greatest things about fiction is you have the opportunity to undo. So whenever you're writing something, it's remembering that it's not set in stone is incredible because it takes the stress out of where you're going. You can always go back and make that change. And I think how cool would it be if we had a control Z in life? You know, you think about to the last decision that you made that ended up being like a really horrendous decision and you could just control Z, let's take that back. And, and then what if the last five decisions that somebody made were really, really horrible? Just control Z, control Z, control Z, control Z, control Z, and you're back at the back. Well, you can't do that in reality, but you get the opportunity to do that in fiction, which is fantastic. It's one of the best things, I think, in life. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, so I'm pretty much done with, uh, with what I had to say, unless anybody else has any other questions. Thank you all again for coming. I really appreciate it. You guys have to be here, but thank you guys for volunteering to come and spending your evening out here. I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm going to give you just um, some feedback sheets if you would.